The wind resource in the UK is the best in Europe, both onshore and offshore, so there are plenty of opportunities in theory to site wind turbines. In this short video we'll be introducing you to how wind power works, the different types and sizes of turbine and we'll cover a few of the main myths you'll come across. Wind turbines work by converting a portion of the energy in wind into rotational motion. This is then converted into electricity by a generator. It may sound obvious, but wind turbines need to be sited in windy places to be economically viable. So, what counts as windy enough? The annual average wind speed at hub height needs to be around 6 meters per second. Hub height is the center of the rotating blades. Commercial developers usually look for speeds in excess of 6.5 meters per second. Because the higher up you are, the windier it is, wind developers prefer the tallest hub height possible in order to maximize the wind speed. And it obviously helps if turbines are sited on hills and in open spaces. This is why there can sometimes be heated debate about landscape impact. What's more, the wind needs to blow from the same direction as much as possible and be uninterrupted by nearby obstacles such as buildings, high hedges and trees. Turbulent sites are not good, even if the gusts of wind are quite fast. It's not unheard of for planning or landscape officers to request that a proposed turbine be made lower, moved nearer to the edge of a woodland or moved further down a hill in order to reduce the landscape impact. The result can be to reduce the wind speed, make it more turbulent and probably make the whole project unviable. Without getting too technical here, it's important that you understand why scale is important. Here's a small and a large wind turbine. So, why is it that the big ones can produce so much more electricity? Well, there's two reasons. Firstly, there is a cubic relationship between wind speed and power output. If the wind speed doubles, the power output is multiplied by eight. Secondly, the power output is proportional to the swept area of the turbine. Therefore, if you double the length of the blade, power output is quadrupled. You'll hear people talk of micro, small, medium and large scale wind. Let's have a look at the differences. Micro wind refers to the very small turbines that are mounted on the roof of a building. Although much fanfare surrounded their arrival on the market several years ago, studies suggest that they're only suitable in a very few areas with exceptional wind speed characteristics. This is because they're prone to building-induced turbulence, which results in low wind speeds and low power output. Sites for this turbine, therefore, need to be chosen with extra care. Small turbines are usually single machines supplying electricity to specific buildings such as farms and schools. They provide about the same electricity over a year as would be used by two to five average sized houses. Size wise they are about 10 meters 30 feet tall although some are smaller and some larger. They are often secured to the ground by guy cables. Individual large and medium scale turbines can also be deployed as single machines but are often used in groups to form part of a larger planning application for a large scale wind farm. Wind farms tend to be located in more remote and rural areas. A large turbine would be anything over 0.5 megawatt capacity up to around 2.5 megawatt. At their largest they could have a tower of 90 meters, about 300 feet, and could provide the same amount of electricity as that consumed by 1,200 houses over a year. Offshore turbines, these are the largest of all and are being used more and more at sea. However, offshore wind farming remains technologically challenging and expensive. Some people think that all wind turbines should be put out at sea, but in the long term we will need to utilise all resources, both offshore and onshore, to meet the challenge of weaning ourselves off fossil fuels. 
Vertical axis turbines. These use a range of designs in which the rotor shaft spins on a vertical axis. A key difference when compared to horizontal axis turbines is that they operate independently to wind direction. In other words, they don't need to be aligned with the prevailing wind. This can be an advantage in locations which experience turbulent wind conditions, such as built-up areas and a small number of small-scale vertical axis turbines have appeared on the market as a consequence. However, technical challenges have resulted in vertical axis turbines not performing well at the larger scale, and so it's unlikely that you'll see big ones in the countryside in the near future. Wind energy, perhaps more than any other renewable technology, is beset by misinformation. They kill large numbers of birds or bats. When the first wind farms began to be developed in the USA some 25 years ago, some of them were indeed responsible for the deaths of large numbers of birds. However, it is now recognized that these wind farms were poorly sited and ironically built in such a way that they became attractive as nesting places for certain birds who were then killed by the blades. Such stories are often taken out of context by those who oppose wind farms. And you should be very wary of accepting generalized statements on this issue without checking which wind farm they refer to and how long ago. Nowadays, both in the USA and in Europe, there are very strict environmental requirements for the siting of wind turbines. And research into the impact of each turbine on wildlife must be undertaken before planning permission can be granted. It's very unlikely indeed that a wind turbine would be granted permission if, for example, it was found to be on a known flight path for birds or bats. A condition of planning in some bat-sensitive areas is that the turbines stop turning for several hours early in the evening at certain times of the year when bats are most active. Myth 2. They're very noisy. Stories of noisy wind turbines are often linked to older turbines and usually smaller ones closer to homes and lower to the ground. The gearboxes on modern large turbines are very quiet indeed and their height off the ground makes it difficult to hear what little noise there is. Most of the noise is from the blade swoosh, the noise made as the blades pass the tower when they rotate. And for much of the time this sound is lost in the background noise of the wind. Before they're granted planning permission, Developers have to carry out noise studies to ensure that nearby properties won't be affected. From the nearest house, which would not be closer than 400 metres, the noise level is likely to be about the same level as the background noise in a bedroom. They can cause epilepsy. This myth arose because of the shadow flicker effect, caused when the sun is low behind the turbine and the blades cast a shadow as they pass in front of the sun. This flickering effect is worse in the winter when the sun is lower for longer. Current research suggests, however, that the blades don't turn anywhere near fast enough to create the kind of flicker that sometimes triggers photosensitive epilepsy, such as the stroboscopic lighting that used to be seen in discos and fairgrounds. But whilst shadow flicker is undoubtedly irritating, the good news is that it is very easy to predict accurately and planning restrictions can require turbines to be shut down for a few hours a day when the effect will occur. They only produce about 30% of the power that the manufacturers claim. Again, this is a myth that attracts anti-wind campaigners because it suggests that the technology is unreliable. But this is really a misunderstanding of the power rating that manufacturers give each model of wind turbine. The power rating, e.g. one megawatt, shows how much electricity a turbine will produce when working at optimum capacity, i.e. when the wind is blowing quite strongly. Clearly, the wind will not blow at a constant speed every hour of every day, and therefore wind turbines don't always produce as much power as they are capable of, but they will still generate a predictable amount of energy over the course of a year. Many anti-wind campaigners misunderstand this distinction, saying effectively, this turbine is capable of generating one megawatt, but most of the time it's only generating 300 kilowatts, therefore it's inefficient. It's clearly wrong to relate this to efficiency, as this is due to the naturally changing wind speeds, not the performance of the turbine. Although the power rating of a wind turbine is a handy indicator of size, what really matters is how much energy the turbine generates over a year. And it is this value that manufacturers need to estimate by taking account of variations in wind speed. If you think about it, this myth is like saying, 
My car is capable of traveling at 100 miles per hour, but I often only drive it at 30 miles per hour, so clearly it's inefficient. Just because your car can travel at 100 miles per hour, it doesn't mean that you expect it to be doing that every time you drive it. What matters is that your car will get you from A to B in a given time, despite many changes in speed along the way. Similarly, for wind turbines, what matters is that the turbine delivers an expected amount of energy over the year, regardless of how hard the wind blows on any particular day. It takes more energy to manufacture a wind turbine than it would generate in its working life. Large commercial wind turbines repay the energy used in their manufacture and installation within five months of starting to operate. And they usually operate for 25 years or more. There are numerous other myths about wind farms and a comprehensive sheet can be found on the Plan Local website. Hopefully, this introduction has shown you that there are different types of turbine you could consider and what would make a good site to investigate initially. If you think that wind is something your community will investigate more thoroughly, the section on setting up a wind project will give you more detail. Thanks for watching.